Thank you so much. Please be seated. Wow. It's so awesome that we can sing about a holy God. Amen. Because He is truly holy. He is truly holy. And who are we? Sinful, vile, you know, I mean, uh, unworthy people that can sing and worship a thrice holy God. Even angels, when they worship the Lord, in Isaiah chapter 6, they cover their eyes, they cover their face, they cover everything. Why? Because God is so holy. So praise God that we are able to do that even here, even this morning. So I, I'm going to introduce a speaker today. You will be blessed because he comes from a blessed church. Amen. The church he comes from is called the Blessed Church. And uh, all of us who visited that church in, October, uh, in September this year, when that church, Blessed Church in Kuching, Sarawak, hosted the 1,000 Bahasa Malaysia pastors. We were so blessed and they are so blessed as well. They are so generous and, and when we were there, you know, we saw the type of people that were there. They are so committed. They serve God without complaining. They serve us without complaining. And, and we were so blessed, really, to be in Blessed Church. And the Blessed Church, to me, is probably one of the most uh, uh, awesome church in the whole of Malaysia. You know what I mean? And, 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 and pray God, let's give God a good clap offering for Pastor G.T. Lim, who's a senior pastor of the Blessed Church, Sarawak. He, he was a, a, a lawyer, you know, he graduated from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand in 1995. But instead of practicing as a lawyer, he gave it up and became a full-time pastor. So he was a lawyer, I was a doctor, but we heard the Lord's call to serve the Lord full-time. And more important than that, there are many things that he do that I can't do, sing. He, he, he can sing very well and uh, he has composed 600 songs altogether. 600 songs, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and some of the songs have, are so well known. I was told by some people, he said, a hey, pastor, not only is he well known among the Christian circles, but even non-Christian circles know his songs and he composed songs for other people to sing. You know, some people told me this morning, hey, pastor, I didn't know that he was a composer of this song that somebody else sings. So he composed songs for other people to sing. He's very, very talented and he was awarded the most impactful male artist in Mandarin category and Lifetime Achievement Award in 2011, the Malaysian Gospel Music. And so apparently, just fresh from the oven, yesterday he won third prize in an international music video uh, uh, competition, uh, video competition in Hong Kong, you know. Just fresh from the oven, third prize, you know. Isn't it amazing? God has really used this man mightily to sing and to, for, for him and, and wonderful testimony so I'm going to, 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 to encourage all of you to listen both on site and online to has been shared uh, testimony three, three services already yesterday was different this morning was an outstanding service in SMCC when we had a combined service with a Chinese church because we do that more often you know such a wonderful wonderful God present service but today you'll be blessed in the third service put your hands together welcome Pastor G.T. Lim from Blessed Church, Kuching, Sarawak. Come on church, you can do better than that. Let this be the best welcome in our third service. Whoa! Thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. Yesterday, they said I, I made people laugh yesterday and this morning I made them cry. And I don't know what I'm going to do now. But oh, I'm under some pressure now because... I happen to be sitting in the same row as my friend from my, the same university. We were in the same batch in Canterbury. Patricia, you know, she knows me very, very well. <laughs> the not so gl glorious part too, yeah. But after that, after graduation, we never met each other again. And Zhao Jun and Lai Chan, they were my leaders in New Zealand, yeah and like Yao Chang Sun, and they were all my leaders in New Zealand. So I, I don't want to talk about New Zealand today. <laughs> so they are here, they might correct, correct me. Anyway, thank God that yesterday, yeah, it was a award ceremony for uh, the MV music video competition organized by a Christian TV station in Hong Kong yesterday. And actually in January, someone approached me about this competition 
and they said they saw my YouTubes and things like that. So they said they would select a few of my songs to participate in the competition. Would I give them permission to do that? I said, why not, you know? And so they did. And that's January. I forgot totally about it until last month, someone else with a strange number contacted me. I was hesitant whether to open it or not. And then, it's someone who said, oh, you are in the finals or, you know, in the competition. And I was thinking, I never joined this competition. It's, it must be a scam, you know. And I even asked my you know, church techno guy, the very technical guy to check, look at the number. Do you, does it look like a scam number? They said, yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> and we even said, and the person's name, who has a name like that? And we zoom in her photo. She does look like a scammer, we said. <laughs> and God forgive us, they were genuine. <laughs> and and I, I received the award yesterday. And let's give glory to God. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we don't understand. Sometimes we don't know. God is doing some amazing things even without our knowledge. We just serve Him, you know. I don't run after all these things. I don't chase after all these things. But all these things chase after me. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this wonderful time, for this wonderful church. And Jesus, I pray for your blood to cover and to cleanse me and everyone here. We pray your, that your Holy Spirit will move powerfully, freely in our lives. Speak to us, Lord. Trim us and prune us. Let us be humble, teachable, and obedient. We want the guidance, the teaching, and anointing of the Holy Spirit. We want to receive from you, not from human understanding, human wisdom, human values or emotions. We want your word, O oh Lord. Speak to us. Let your name be glorified. Pray that we all grow to bear fruit to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's give the glory to God again. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know what Patricia and Jiao Jun they are thinking now. Oh, I see some of my church members here too. Yeah, Irene is here. Praise the Lord. And I, I don't know whether they, they thought at the time when we were in New Zealand that I would become a pastor, you know, and that, I would, yeah, and all that kind of thing. But I, I was very zealous in serving God. I was a church van driver every Sunday. I would pick up people to go to church, the first to go out, the last to come home, and all these things. So a lot of my stories, they, they would know. And praise the Lord that today, you know, I don't really understand many things that God has done in my life. But I'm going to share two verses with you first, from two uh, scriptures. Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I first got in touch with this verse when I was in New Zealand. And because of certain things that happened, and I believe, especially Patricia will remember, two of our friends died in New Zealand. One of them was actually her flatmate, Pauline, right? Do you know that Pauline's sister is in this church? She came up to me yesterday and asked me, do you know Pauline Young? I said, yes. She said, I'm the sister. See, she doesn't even know. Yeah, and yeah, all these stories are true, you see. Um, our friend Pauline Young, she passed away in New Zealand. She's also a university student in our fellowship. And... Then later, another friend of mine from Penang, a very, very clever law student, and who was also my holiday flatmate, and he had a freak accident, he passed away too. And at the time, I remember, I couldn't understand, you know? These, these are Christians, young people, good students. When I saw the parents, you know, I was like, God, I don't understand all this thing. So I called home, I called my sister. I said, I'm very sad, my friend died, I don't understand. And my sister quoted this verse, you know, so I remembered it too today. 
just trust God, you know. You may not understand it. You may not like it. You may not be able to accept it. But if you really believe that God is real, God is good, God is your Father, then trust that He knows what He is doing. Amen. Trust that He knows what He is doing. You may not like His decision. You may not like what He is doing. That's why when we all know, I believe just about every Christian, after you've been a Christian for a few years, you would come across this verse. You know, many preachers will talk about it. God's ways and God's thoughts are higher than ours. We know. And we say, Amen. We believe. But do you really believe that? If you do, then why do you question God when something goes wrong or when something is not according to plan, when your prayers are not answered, when your requests are not being granted and all these things, and your faith rises and your faith drops and you are so easily affected. One moment you are active, you are zealous. Another moment you turn cold, you want to take a break, you want to work things out. We always want to work things out. Why do you need to work things out? Do you think you can really work things out? If you can fully work things out with God and you can fully comprehend and understand Him, that means our God's brain is as big as yours. And that is scary to think. Yeah, we can't even save ourselves. Why do you want our God to think like us, to be like us? So, in a way, when there are things that we don't understand, that we cannot comprehend, that just shows that our God is so much higher than us. And if you trust Him, just when we say we trust God, many times we believe in God, we trust God, we are actually saying that, yeah, I trust Him. So I believe that my prayer will be answered, right? I believe that He will grant the desires of my heart. My request will be granted. I trust Him. I pray, I pray, and I believe. And what if he doesn't grant you the desires of your heart? What if your prayer is not answered? What if he's not doing what you want him to do? Do you still trust him? Right? Some people, that one young man came to me long, long ago. He was crying, he's crying, and he was so interested in this girl. But the girl was not interested in him at all. So he cried in front of me. He said, I don't understand. I, I believe with all my heart. I prayed day and night for the girl to like me. <laughs> Sounds like black, black magic to me. <laughs> Sounds like voodoo, you know. You don't like me, you don't love me. I'll pray until you fall in love with me. In Chinese, right? Oh, like black magic. I said, what kind of, you know, what kind of faith is that? Blind faith. You don't know the word of God. Or, like this morning I was sharing in the bilingual service, my little brother was sick when he was about nine years old. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed and he died. My brother died. So, do you still trust God? Do you still believe in Him? And some of you here, you are in financial difficulty. You are struggling financially. You have been praying for a breakthrough, praying for a new job, a new business, a new opportunity. But it's been years. You are still in financial problem. Do you still trust God? If you believe He is God, you have to trust Him despite all the things He has allowed, despite the situation that may, be to, may not be to your liking. That is called trusting God. You know, I can pray, I can request, I can ask, but if God decides otherwise, or if God delays, or if God does something else that's not to your liking, do you still believe in Him? Do you still trust Him? That is called, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, and I will continue to trust you, serve you, and love you anyway. If you do, 
then we'll come to the next verse, Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things, all things, the good and the bad, whatever you like, whatever you don't like, things you can accept, things you can't accept, all things God works for the good. Doesn't mean these are good things. There can be horrible, there can be um, terrible things that happen to you, but God can turn them around if, if you continue to love Him. All those experiences, all those bad memories or whatever, they can be turned around to become beneficial, not just to you, but to others. They can become a blessing. They can become a tool for you to help people, you know, but the condition is you must continue to love Him. If you don't, many people, you know, will backslide. They will turn away from God and they will start um, doubting God or even feel disappointed or angry with God. Then this verse doesn't apply anymore. It doesn't apply anymore. So we've got to continue to love Him. Love means listen to what He says, follow and do what He wants you to do anyway. So if you really trust Him, then allow Him to work. Allow Him to make all the decisions. And you have been called according to His purpose. We are all called to serve Him. So in my life, and... My friends, they would know, especially Patricia. Actually, Patricia was my very, very good friend. I shared a lot with her. And yeah, we were only good friends. Yeah. <laughs> she married someone else, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I shared a lot with her, my, my struggles, you know. And yeah, I, I went through a lot of um, financial troubles and struggle with God and whatever. So... But I, I, I continue to serve God. Some of our friends, good friends, unfortunately, some of them don't even go to church anymore. We were in the same fellowship. And some of them might just be ordinary Christian now. And the unlikely one became the pastor. Do you know, we, we had this choir once, right? We were dancing, you know, in front of the whole church. And I, I was given the role to, to be in charge of a choir. And we had some very good singers in our fellowship. And one you know, from, from David and Teki, they all could sing very well. But I was the capo one, the busybody who, who likes to organize things, get things done. I would choose the song, I'll organize it. Then I would choose uh, who sing what parts. And then we perform this choir in front of the whole church, a Kiwi church. And there, there are certain lines that I would ask a few people to sing solo. Just one line or two lines. So the pastor asked me to do that, to organize that. And yeah, my pastor, he trusted me. He loved me. After the performance, he said, very good. Your choir was good. And because I sang one part too, solo, he said, Maybe you shouldn't have sung solo. <laughs> you should get someone else to sing. You know, that is the encouragement I got from him. And so I was an unlikely candidate to be a gospel singer. To be, when I participated in competition, you know, singing competition, sometimes I wouldn't even enter semi-final, not let alone final. It's hard for me to win. And yet God gave me the gift to write songs. And... I'm not trained musically. I only know a few simple chords that I knew back then. Until now, I still know the same chords. But God has used those simple chords. I asked God before, why don't... You know, actually, there were people, there were music teachers, music school principal who recognized my so-called gifting, my desire to serve God. They gave me free lessons to learn piano and everything, by right, I should be able to learn, to pick up the skill. Because ever since I was in primary school, they said I have musical sense, I know the beat, I could learn songs very fast, but I don't understand why I could never pick up piano until today, 
I cannot read music. Not even the do, re, mi, fa, so. One, two, three, four, five. You give me a song like that and ask me to sing, I cannot sing it. Because I just don't know. And yet, God would give me a gift to write songs. I would remember the songs. I would record them. Or else, I would, you know, after some time, I don't know how to sing them anymore. So I have to record them because I don't know how to write the music. And yet, God would use someone like that. I don't understand. I always ask God, why don't you help me to be able to master some music theory, some basic notes that I can read, I can sing. But God never gave me that gift. Then one day, I kind of understood so that I would give all the glory to Him. You know, so that if I write a good song, if I produce a good album, people will not say he's from this school, he's trained by that teacher, he knows music so well, he's got a music degree or whatever. But every time when people ask me, I said, I'm not trained, I don't know, it's all from God. If I leave God, I will lose everything. So I have to stay close to God. So having said that, let me share with you my song for today, which is also the title for my sharing. I don't need to understand. I don't think Patricia remembers this song. Actually, the first time I sang this song, she was there, you know. Yeah, so nobody remembers. Um, at the time, I, I couldn't sing very well too. I, I still don't sing very well now, but I, I try to convince you I sing well. <laughs> and I wrote this song because I was about to come back to uh, Malaysia after my graduation and they wanted me to share my testimony. So I wrote it into a song to share. So the song really tells you my journey. It's called, I Don't Need to Understand. Thank you. The autumn wind whispers the end of yet another season The winter sky reminds me for everything there's a reason So many times I've tried to understand our Father's wisdom Just to find that without His love I'm nothing but a foolish man For all my questions, doubts and fears Struggles, heartaches, troubles and tears One by one they've disappeared Like paper in the air One thing I can say that's carried me through all these years It's been planted in my heart And in my heart to stay It's not in how much I understand But how much I trust His name Not in how much I understand But how much I trust that helps me stand For all my questions, doubts and fears Struggles, heartaches, troubles and tears one by one they've disappeared Like vapor in the air oh, oh. And there is one thing I can say That's carried me through all these years It's been planted in my heart And in my heart to stay It's not in how much I understand but how much I trust His name Not in how much I understand But how much I trust 
that helps me stand For I don't need to understand Before I can teach my heart to listen Oh, I don't need to comprehend before I can bring myself into full submission to trust His name. Oh, I don't need to understand before I can teach my heart to listen. Oh, I don't need to comprehend before I can bring myself into full submission to trust His name. There is one thing I can say that's carried me through all these years. It's been planted in my heart and in my heart to stay I don't need to understand I just need to trust His name Not in how much I understand But how much I trust That helps me stand Amen not how much I understand, but how much I trust. So I was sharing the story about my New Zealand life yesterday. Thank God I shared that yesterday. And that is part one of my life. And after that, I came back to Malaysia. Actually, I had fallen in love in New Zealand. I love the life there and everything. And it's hard. That's why many of you, you send your children overseas, right? They don't want to come back, right? It's your fault. <laughs> But so, I didn't want to come back too. So then I prayed, and I knew by that time, God brought me to New Zealand, not so much for a career or for my study or degree or whatever, but God wanted me to know He is real. He's really my father, and He'll carry me through all my life, you know. So I decided I want to come back, and I prayed to God. You know, I had to force myself to pray that prayer. God, if you really want me to come back to Malaysia, change my heart. You know, he really changed my heart. So, and suddenly there's this desire to come home. Well, I came back to Malaysia. I didn't practice law. Actually, I never practiced law. Yeah. I, I went into teaching for about two years because I love young people and I am a kampong boy from a small town, from a poor family, and how God, uh, I met God, and He became my father, and how He transformed my life, and how, how I, I could graduate from, from New Zealand. So I love to share that with young people, especially the poor ones, who always think they don't have a future, they don't have hope, and all these things. I like them to know there is a God, you know, a real God who is your father. So I went into teaching for two years. I applied, you know, I applied. It's very, very interesting. When I came back from New Zealand, um, before I went back to coaching, I stopped over in KL. One of my good friend's mother, she is um, an expert in Mandarin. So she taught Mandarin in some Chinese middle schools, Chinese secondary school. And she, she's so surprised that I could speak Mandarin because her, her children all speak English. They don't like Chinese. So suddenly, she took a liking to me and she discovered that I pronounced so many Chinese words wrongly because we were from the traditional teaching. We didn't know the Chinese because by, when I was still in school, we wrote the traditional characters the Chinese traditional characters, then the Chinese became lazy, they simplified, 
the Chinese characters to become the simplified form. And then we used to learn poor, poor, more for that time of, and I wasn't good at that too. And then they changed it to Han Yi Pin In using Romanized characters. That's a lot easier anyway. So everything was changed when I came back to Malaysia. The Chinese language uh, education system for the Chinese subject was changed. So this, I was only spending one or two weeks there in KL. And this auntie, she said, since you are interested in the Chinese language, let me teach you how to pronounce Chinese words properly. Do you know there's a difference between si and shi? There's a difference. Si is for, shi is yes. Do you know there's a difference between chuang and chuan? Chuang is the bed you sleep in. Chuan is a boat. You know, before that, we, we were all messed up, you know? So, I don't know why, she just taught me that. She taught me how to write pin in, how to pronounce pro properly, yeah, out of respect. I learned from her, out of respect, since she was so lonely, since she had no one, you know, who could appreciate Chinese in her family. So I learned from her. And while I was there, uh, yeah, before that, I applied, I applied to the education ministry to work as a part-time teacher because we were not trained. We could only wait for an opening. If there's a school, there, the teacher is on leave or something, they would get you in. I was waiting and waiting. I applied to be an English teacher. And I received no news at all. And then suddenly, the education department called my family and said, oh, there's an opening now in a secondary school. Would you like to come and teach for a few months? I said, what, what subject? Senior classes, Chinese. <laughs> hey, I'm a law graduate from New Zealand. You want me to come and teach Chinese, senior Chinese classes? I said, but I, I, I'm not good at Chinese. I, I didn't even study Chinese in Form 5, you know? I sat for the exam out of interest in Form 5. I took one subject of Chinese until Form 3. After that, we were not offered the Chinese um, subject in Form 4 and Form 5, but my teacher said my Chinese was, wasn't bad, so I could sit for the test myself. So I scored a credit 3, a C3 at the time. That's my Form 5 Chinese result. So they said, but... You've got a C3 in your SPM certificate. We need someone, you know. I said, yeah, yeah, but I want to teach English. Then they said, if you want to teach English, sorry, no opening. Either take it or leave it. So I had to take up the teaching job, teaching. You know, sometimes my students corrected me or challenged me, you know. <laughs> so... Because they were all trained by the new system, or sometimes when I was writing words on the blackboard, my, t my students said, what words are those? Those are from the museum. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, so, as a responsible person, every night before I would go to school the next day, every night, if I were going to teach a story, to read an essay from the textbook, I would search almost every word in the dictionary to make sure I didn't mispronounce any word, to make sure I knew the correct pronunciation, the correct meaning. I did that for two years. And I became a Chinese expert. You know? <laughs> and, yeah. and many people began to think I graduated from Taiwan. And once I was ministering in KL in a Chinese church, you know, and they took us out, the, the elders, the leaders took me out for, for supper after the meeting, the Chinese meeting. They were sitting around and they were talking and they were conversing in English until they realized I was there. <laughs> because I was quietly eating my supper. And they turned to me and they said, Oh, so sorry, do you understand English? I would say, yeah, a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it became, you know what that shows? That shows that God is really amazing. 
Like, why, Lord? Why did you? I want to reach out to young people. I asked for an opportunity to teach in a high school. So give me that opportunity. And why do you ask me to go and teach Chinese? That's not, not what I'm good at. But you don't understand it? God knew. He was preparing me for Chinese ministry. He was training me. You know, when I first came back to Kuching, I visited so many churches. Of course, I went back to SIB first. I was baptized in SIB. My brother-in-law, my sisters, and they are still leaders there up, up to today. I went there. I don't know. I just didn't fit in. Nobody noticed me. Can you believe it? Nobody noticed me. <laughs> you know. Okay, come on. Yeah. So, because I, I, I was always overshadowed by my brother-in-laws, my sisters, you know, they, they, are, they are so much older than me. So, people would always notice them. They didn't notice me ever since, you know. I started going there since I was from one until from six. Then I went to New Zealand. And after graduation, I came back. Still, nobody knew who I was. So, so in the end, I, I went around searching for churches that, people would notice me, you know, you know. Because I thought I was so fervent and so zealous in serving God when I was a university student. Now I came back, I wanted to serve, but somehow people didn't know. So I went from church to church, all the English-speaking churches. Then one day, I just visited this Chinese-speaking church, and I went there. Somehow I felt, this is a place they were singing very Chinese song. Uh, like, uh, With a lot of vibratos. And somehow I, I felt that I wanted to come back there. So I stayed that, in that church until, yeah, until now. So, so I joined that church. Then the pastor realized that, you know, there were so few people in that church. So they noticed me immediately. <laughs> so if you want people to notice you, <laughs> this is not the place to come. <laughs> Too many people, see? Yeah, no, just kidding. So come here. This is a good church. Right? Come here, especially if you are rich. Give money here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, and the pastor was very smart, very wise, and he said, oh, oh, university graduate and everything. Oh, immediately, they drove me in, and he invited me for lunch, for dinner and everything, and then, and, and then yeah, I was very active by then, serving the young people, and so then he heard that I wrote songs, and, and he asked me to share, he asked me to share my testimony, you know, in a Chinese church. He asked me to share my testimony. I said, can I speak in English? Can you translate? He said, no, no, just use Chinese. I'm not used to speaking in Chinese. You know? And when they asked me to pray, can I pray in English? You know? And then when I read the Bible, I read the English Bible. You know why? You know, so I was like, I wanted people to know I graduated from New Zealand. <laughs> That's why God sent me to teach Chinese in a secondary school to force me to switch my language. Because I told Pastor Chu, I am someone who works well under pressure. I'm a very laid back person. If you don't push me, if you don't force me, I will not do it. So now I'm a Chinese language teacher. So I have to learn the language. Anyway, to cut the story short, and they thought that I was serving well, and they encouraged me to go and study in Bible school. So I went to Singapore to do two years of Bible school at Tongling, Tongling Bible College there. Initially, I just wanted to do six months. The idea of going to the Bible school came because when I was teaching, one day, a student was possessed by demon, you know? And so they came to me because the students said, 
I'm a Christian. I was always reaching out. I was always reaching out. So they came to us. They said, he's a ghostbuster. <laughs> so they came and I was trying to help the girl. And it was a very fierce demon. I wasn't trained. And I became scared myself because she looked really horrible, you know. And the demon was very fierce. And in the end, I, I don't think the demon left her. I even felt that the, the, the demon went home with me. So I was like, where's the demon now, you know? So I thought, oh dear, there's one, something I don't know about, cast, uh, about Christianity, casting out demons. So I thought, I better go to a Bible school <laughs> to learn how to cast out demons without knowing many Bible school lecturers don't even know how to cast out a demon. So we went, we went, actually, oh, I was all on fire. I must, so with this one goal, I want to learn to cast out demons. That's why I went to a Bible school. And one day, we had this casting out demon expert who came to teach us. Oh, he is really well known at the time, you know, always casting out demons. I was so interested to learn. And, you know, Tong Ling being the more charismatic at our spirit field school that believe in casting out demons. And then one day we were contacted by a father who sent her daughter to a very traditional Bible school in Singapore. And they don't really believe in this kind of casting out demons or healing kind of thing. But apparently the girl, a Bible school student, she was demonized. So the father said, could your school help? Because the father knew our teacher, our lecturer. So they sent her there. Wow, this is case study, man. Oh, all right. I said, this is what I came for. And so, there, the girl was there. So, we have so many students, about 20 students or so, all from different backgrounds, all from different churches, with all our different theologies, and all very messed up. <laughs> and you see how the cast, I was just, because I wanted to learn. I was observing most of the time. Some of them were holding the girl down and some of them were screaming and some of them were shouting. Some people said, you don't shout. You have power. Just get out. <laughs> if you have power and authority, the demon will come out. But the demons don't come out anyway. So, and some, of, some people believe that if you want the demon to leave, they must vomit out something, right? The, uh, uh, so so they, they brought this dustbin. They pushed the girl's head. Two, from your two, two. Vomit, vomit. And I was like, I was helping to push the girl's head out because they are pushing her head into the dustbin. And I was so worried that she was suffocate. So there's a two, two, two. And she didn't vomit out anything. And then some, some, they, so they held her down. She was quite big size too. She was like so helpless. And the father was there watching the entire, uh, so traumatic to me. And the father was there. And the girl, the girl looked at the father. Dad, help me. Save me. And, and my teacher said, Ha, huh, don't you answer her. You don't recognize the devil as your daughter. Now the devil is calling you daddy. You must not answer. And the girl said, Pa! Chiuwa! Pa, Chiuwa, save me, daddy. And my lecturer asked the father to answer. I'm not your daddy. Pa. I'm not a, a daddy of a devil. And the girl said, and I thought, is that real or what? <laughs> and then the girl actually said, you know, the girl said, Nali you ren The girl said, who casts out demons like this? I was like, I'm here to learn. Don't don't stumble me, you know. <laughs> and and then finally, the girl said, you know, there were some guys were holding her down and this smaller girl sitting on her thighs actually because she could jump and jump and I saw this girl jumping up and down. She's very strong. Uh, apparently there was demon in her too. But 
I think she was conscious. It was human at that time. So when the father disowned her, and she said, then she said, um, can I go to the toilet? Um, I really need to use the loo now. Ah, my lecturer said, that is a trick. The devil always does that. The devil is about to lose. Then they'll say they want to go to the toilet, they want to pang jio, they want to pang sai. Then they will lock up the room. They will not come out anymore. Huh? Don't be fooled. Guys, start praying seriously now. The demon is about to leave. The demon is about to come out. So, no, I really want to be a no, I really need, it's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, I really need the toilet. I promise you, I'll come back here. <laughs> Poor girl. And my lecturer said, no, no, no. Pray fervently. Out, out. Then she said, if you hold me down, I may not be able to hold. My urine will come out. Then my teachers I said, don't listen to all these lies from the devil. Yeah, you must never believe in the lies of the devil. So, in the name of Jesus, out, out, out. The urine came out. <laughs> and, and this girl who was sitting on the thigh, she jumped off, she said, I felt something warm. I mean, why are you laughing? Poor girl. It's so traumatic. I was like, my goodness, this is the number one authority in casting out demons, the expert. Oh, I, then I, I decided casting out demons is not my ministry. <laughs> no, I will. So that's why when I started um, pastoring, I told God, don't bring any demon to our church. You know? Any demon person once sent to other churches, I will not be able to help them. Anyway, yeah, and then... We learned so many things. Initially, I wanted to do six months. Then I discovered there were still so many things I didn't know. So I lengthened and lengthened until I, full the, I finished the full length of two years, the diploma in pastoral ministry. And then I, th I thought I knew quite a lot already. Then in our final two weeks, in our final two weeks, they invited this, um, do you know Edward Miller? There's this very old revivalist who was kind of um, a catalyst, instrumental to the Argentinian revival long, long ago. Yeah, Pastor Edward Miller. And he came, very old man, I think 70 plus or something, he, American. He came to our Bible school to teach, to share for the final two months. Final two months. So... I was obviously the only one who could interpret for him. So I was translating for him. So we were all so excited, you know, a revivalist, Argentinian revival. And he came, he was very old. He came up. He started his sermon. Do you know God? I thought, what a stupid question to ask in a Bible school, you know? If we don't know God, what are we doing here? We are Bible school students. He must be getting old. You know? Do you know God? If you know God, raise your hand. Of course, everybody raise your hand. We are Bible school students. Hello. Of course, we know God. We are here to serve God. Good. And everybody raise your hand. Put your hand down. Then he started quoting scriptures. He started giving examples, asking questions about God, you know, parables and all this until he asked again, do you know God? If you know God, explain to me how he puts oh, the, the tree, the branches, the leaves, the fruit, the flowers, or oh, all the roots, all into one tiny seed. How did God command the seed to grow? How could God squeeze such a big tree in such a small seed? You know God, huh? Tell me, how did he do that? All these things, one of the examples. Then he said, do you know God? Raise your hand. Nobody raised their hand. We were like, am I even saved? 
you know. And, and then I started, then he started asking all of us, what were you before you came to the Bible school? And some people said, I was working in the office. Go back to work in the office. And you, lawyer, go back and be a lawyer. And wow, one by one, he was telling, who do you think you are that you want to pastor a church? Do you know many pastors are leading their congregation to hell? <laughs> Many people assume they know God, they love God, they are teaching their own way, they are thinking of their own agenda, and many churches are going to hell. All you young people, what do you know about God? Go back to your profession. I was like, hey, crazy man, who have we invited? You know, it's so hard to find young people like us. Law graduate, bilingual, good looking some more. That's a bonus, you know? And to, to have people like, young people like that to give up everything, to serve God, and now you, old man, you come and discourage us? Wh whose side are you on, man? You know, and then he started telling us, you know, oh, you all think you love God so much and everything. Wow, I tell you, after the first lesson, we had an emergency meeting with our dean. I told my dean, Better not let him speak anymore. anymore. He is stumbling everyone. And all, I said, I actually said, he is so proud and arrogant. Maybe he thinks he's a revivalist and maybe that's long ago. He's still living in his fantasy or something and he doesn't know us. How can he discourage young people like that, you know? How can he say we don't know God and everything? We told our dean, maybe don't let him speak anymore. Or all the students are like agreeing, yeah. And then my dean was very wise. My, my, my dean was affected too, actually. He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder why he's like that, you know. Yeah, maybe he has changed. But let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's listen to him a second time. A second time. So he, he spoke again. I tell you, the Holy Spirit started moving. And God, I mean, at least to me, I, I felt that God was dealing with our pride. We really knew. See, look, I tell you, if you have a young person, a law graduate, bilingual, or you, you are talented and gifted, you really think that you, you are very smart. You really think that you are an asset the church cannot do without you. You think you are so special, right? So that's why. And when he was challenging us, in the end, we were not even sure whether we were saved. You know, he was so sensitive in the spirit. So I began, I, I felt I have a lot to learn from this man. You know, actually, the, the night before I interpreted for him, I was in Singapore, right? Uh, my Bible school. The night before, I was in KL. Yeah. And I, I brought about 90 roses to attend a beautiful girl's graduation to propose to her. I was rejected. And, and I flew back to the morning I flew back to interpret. I didn't even have time to lick my wounds. I didn't even have time to feel I've lost my love or whatever, you know. Now, forget about the girl. Do I know God? Am I going to hell? You know, it's really God's timing, you know. I didn't even have time to think about the night before all my roses. You know, I was so poor, I paid for all those roses. <laughs> and I was, yeah, it's like that. I was still thinking. And it's amazing. Then he started saying, you all think that you love God, right? Yeah. Just now, pastor was telling me there is a culture in our church and when I knew, everyone would kneel, right? The whole church would kneel. It started from Edward Miller. He said, you guys say you honor God, you fear God. When you sing, I bow down, I kneel down. Nobody is bowing, nobody is kneeling. You're just singing a song. You're just saying you don't mean anything you say. You don't mean anything you sing. If you don't want to clap, then skip that line about clapping your hands. If you don't want to kneel, then skip that word. Don't sing that word. If you sing it, do it. Wow, we're like, oh. so we start kneeling and we start clapping and dancing, you know, all those words. Because you've got to sing in spirit and in truth. You've got to be honest. And he said, and all these songs about Jesus, I love you. I give my life to you. 
how many of you actually mean that? You know, and after that lesson, in the afternoon, my dean and all of us, we look through all the songs that we sing. We had to throw away so many songs. <laughs> Seriously. Any song that say, Jesus, I love you. No, out, out, out. Because we realize that we love ourselves so much more. We realize that there's so many. God is not even in the top 10 in our list. So we could only sing. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. We, wow, we sang that song all the time, Psalm 51. So after two weeks, I decided I will not become a pastor. I will go back and become a lawyer. I got offered a job in Penang, and there was... Um, I should be working in Penang as a lawyer. And that lawyer, who is the boss, is also the spiritual son of Edward Miller. So he is also a pastor, lawyer. And he wanted to employ me. And by that time, I was out of the legal practice for four or five years. And I thought, wow, this is a gift from heaven, right? To be a lawyer and an assistant pastor at the same time. You know, it seems like perfect, but I tell you, even when something seems so spiritual and so perfect, it may not be from God. It is a good thing, but God doesn't want you to be in His just good will. He wants you to be in His perfect will. Perfect will. Not just something you think is good. That's why many Christians, they come to church every Sunday. Yeah, they join the cell group. That's good enough. They think that's good enough. I tell you, there is a lot more God wants you to do. Hear me, SIBKL? Yeah, I'm leaving later on anyway. <laughs> so, there is a lot more that God wants you to do. So, I, I told him, okay, I will work for you. But I said, but... I have promised this church, remember this Chinese church? And this Chinese church said, the pastor said he's going to study in Penang somewhere else and there is no pastor anymore in this church. Gitiong, can you come back to help the church for six months while they look for their pastor? While they look for their real pastor, you come and stand in first to help. I said, okay. So I asked this boss and I said, can I go back to help the church first? Can you wait for me? And I will start work in January 1996 in Penang as a lawyer, as an assistant pastor. He said, sure, I'll wait for you. So I went back. I started pastoring on July 1st, 1995. So I went back there. My first sermon do you know God? <laughs> Seriously. Because the, the, the co-worker was telling me, oh, the church has not been growing, you know. Uh, people would come late. They would not stand during worship. They would leave before your sermon is over. What kind of church is that? So I came back. Do you know God? Do you know that you are going to hell? <laughs> Everybody got so scared. I believe the fear of God came. And for one entire year, we sang just about one song only. <laughs> Create in me a clean heart. You know, I really learned. When I learned something, I really learned. But amazingly, people started crying and they would come up even before preaching. You would see tears. You would see people crying. Uh, yeah, the young and old in front and asking for God's mercy, asking for God to forgive. And suddenly there's this whole new excitement, a slight revival in the church and they were all excited. But the problem is I only promised them that I would be ministering for six months, to serve for six months. So almost every Sunday, I would remind them, pray for your real pastor. I'm not your pastor. I'm not your pastor. Pray for your pastor to come. I'm going to leave you in January. I'm going to leave. And you know, I'm not your pastor. I said that almost every week until God was so fed up. <laughs> Can you stop saying that? Who would ever learn commitment? You know, if you always say, I'm going to do it for a few months, then I'm going away. Who would understand what it is you know, to give your life, you know? And then God was saying, a pastor is like a father. You don't abandon your children. You keep on telling your children, I'm not your real father, you know? 
Your father is still lost somewhere outside there. Pray for your father to come home. I'm not a real one. You know, what can, your church will be so unstable and insecure. They don't know how to serve God. I said, oh God, but I, I promised that guy, you know, six months. Or oh, maybe, okay God, I'll stay another year. Another year? Aren't you thick? What does that mean? What is the difference? You know, six months, another year. Then God was saying, not another year, it's the same. You are a father now. I said, then what, what? How long do I have to be here? Okay, then I said, oh Jesus, you, you served on earth, you ministered for three years, right? Three and a half years. So can I stay here for three and a half years? <laughs> and God said, then you die. <laughs> right? Then you die. Then you go on the cross. I said, oh no, that, that doesn't work too, you know. And I was saying, so what, God? What am I going to do, you know? And then God said, you don't leave until I ask you to go. I will help you. So I called the lawyer friend. I said, I'm sorry, I'm not coming anymore. I have to stay back here. And the members too, they told me, Pastor, now for the first time, we feel that we want to know God. <laughs> And you want to leave, you know. Can you just stay back? That's why in the end, God kept me. And it has been 28 years. <laughs> the six months, it turns out to be 28 years. What time do I stop? <laughs> oh, two o'clock. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, anyway. Yeah, I began to learn and... I was even trembling in my office. I didn't know how to pastor. I didn't know what to do. And yeah, one, you know, just before I came back to pastor, I was still in Tongling. Not just Edward Miller that shook my faith. You know, there were times when people were so-called filled with the Holy Spirit, laughing, you know, it was very popular then. It's the trend. Uh, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you must laugh. If you don't laugh, you're not filled. Yeah. <laughs> So I never laughed. I never rode on the floor. So I was his interpreter. And there was this lady who was all oh, so happy, was laughing until her tears came out rolling on the floor. And auntie, you know, in our Bible school, I was sitting beside Edward Miller. So I wanted to learn. So I asked her, I asked him, so what do you think she's experiencing? You know, all the joy, you know, all the laughter for so long. Edward Miller turned to me. It's fake. It's fake. You know, it's all fake. And he said, ask her to stop. Don't make a fool of herself. Wow, my goodness. And ta, 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 ni ting, ah. yeah. How do you ask her to stop? Yeah. Fake. Wow, the lady was so offended. Notice she could stop immediately. But she was very, very offended. And she was very angry. And I was like, wow, if it's the Holy Spirit, I don't see the fruit. You know? And so upset and angry. That's why in churches now, so many people claim they have gifts, they can see visions, they are prophetic, you know, they see this. And, they, and when the pastor doesn't give them the pulpit, doesn't share what they see, oh, they're angry. They leave the church. They said the pastor is jealous of them. Give me a break. You know, that just shows it is fake. It is not real. So, yeah, I was like, wow, there's so many things. I, how can I be a pastor? I don't even know. I don't even discern. I don't even, you know, distinguish all these things. And then just before I went back to Kuching, there was another prophet uh, this one is from Taiwan already. And we were in this meeting. The elder said, now this prophet is going to give us a test of, from Genesis. He received revelation from God to ask 10 very simple questions from creation. If you get 10 out of 10, that means you are really called according to God's purpose to be a pastor, to be a leader. And he said, most time, people will not score 10, maybe 7 to 10, that means you is confirmed. God wants to use you. 5 or 6, you still need to learn something. Below 5, you've got to reconsider whether God has called you. And he said, 
nobody will score zero, don't worry. So we were sitting there. I was thinking, oh, it's another chance for me to show I am so cold. You know, I will score 10 out of 10, I'm sure. Then we started sitting, and then, then he, did, he announced the results. Guess what I got out of 10? Zero. I got all the answers wrong. I was like, what stupid test is this? You know, I don't think it's from God or what. But actually, I, I regret till today that I didn't keep that test paper. Because today, I realized that is my graduation certificate. Without God, I'm nothing. Don't think that you are so smart. Don't think that you can answer all the questions. Don't think that just because you score 10 out of 10. You know, so many years later, I remember this incident. I was like, why? And this pastor, this prophet knows me very well and he likes me too. He is totally surprised. How come you score zero? Nobody ever scored zero before. I said, yeah, ask yourself. It's your test. He said, I think then God wants to use the foolish, the weak, uh, and the helpless. And then he, I said, yeah, oh, yeah, because God wants me to empty myself. I used to think I'm capable, I'm talented, I'm gifted, I'm educated and everything. I, I was a born leader and everything, and suddenly I scored zero. And anyway, I remember that, and I thank God that he reminded me that I'm nothing without him. Then many, many years later, just a few years ago, I met this elder who organized that prophetic test. He's a pastor in Singapore now. I said, hey. He said, you're doing well now, huh? I said, yeah, you almost stumbled me organizing that kind of test. Do you remember I scored zero? He said, yeah, 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 I remembered. I said, wow. And then he said, do you know there's another person who scored zero in that test? I said, really? I thought I was the only one. I never knew another one. Then I said, who? And he mentioned the name. Seriously, that is your prodigy. That's the person he wanted to hand the Young Adults Fellowship to. Someone who, whom he wanted to train as a pastor. I said, the person scored zero too? I never knew that. He said, yes. And then what happened to her now? She left. She didn't want to serve God anymore. She was so upset. She was so hurt by the test. Till today, she didn't come to the church. She didn't serve anymore. Wow. That's why. That's why. I don't need to understand. I don't know why I scored zero. But do you still trust God? Do you still want to be used by Him? You can have the exact, exactly the same result, two persons, but see the direction you choose. Like when you have a tragedy, God is not answering your prayer, you can choose to run away from God, get angry with God, and you move further and further away, and you get worse and worse, you become very bitter, and in the end, you might be lost forever. Or, you don't understand. You are hurt, but you still hang on to God anyway. You still come to God. I don't understand. I don't like it. But God, you are my God. You are still good. No matter what I feel, you cling on to Him. It is different. And yeah, I think my time is almost up or is up already here. So I still have many, many stories to share with you. So I went back to Kuching. I told God there are two things that I don't want to see in my church. One, don't bring any demonized person because I don't know how to cast out demons. <clears throat> Number two, don't let anyone die in my church. I'm very scared of looking at dead bodies. I don't know how to conduct funerals. So, but my church was full of old people at that time. They want to die. How can you stop them from going to heaven, you know? Please don't die. I don't know how to conduct your funeral, you know? So, you know, in the end, because I told God, I'm a young man, I love young people, and I, I'm a gospel singer. Give me young people. Give me good sound system, good band and music. God didn't give me young people. God didn't give me good musical instruments. I had to 
play the guitar myself with my limited skill and chords. And there was no young person, all the old people. And God brought people with demons. <laughs> and I conducted so many funerals. <laughs> so that's why, you know, you don't understand why, but the reason is God wants you to lean on Him. If He had given me my gifting, my calling, so-called calling, uh, youthful ministry, music, I'll be using my skill. I'll be doing what I like, I enjoy, I'm used to, I'm, I'm an expert in any way. But when God gives me old people, funerals, demons, all these things that I don't want to touch, I don't like, I don't know how, I don't know what, you will rely on God. And I just started to grow because of demonized cases <laughs> and because of funerals. Because I make everything evangelistic, you know. In, in the funeral, I made it evangelistic. And in our church, if people want to invite me to a wedding, there must be a stage for me to sing and preach. If I don't get to give altar call or whatever in a wedding, I don't attend weddings. So it must be evangelistic. So that's what God did. Anyway, that's how our church started. Many demonized cases and many funerals. And then later on, after many years, you know, God has blessed us with so many things. And finally, finally, there are still many, many stories. And like that song, <coughs> Hold My Hand. And yeah, my church, like I shared yesterday, the old people wanted to leave initially because I was not good at serving old people. I was always the, the youth leader the, 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 in youth ministry. So when some elderly people heard that I was coming back to be the pastor, they were worried. They said, that young man, that arrogant young man who couldn't be bothered about the elders, you know, they said, I... I once, when my pastor was still there, they came to tell me, hey, Gityong, Gityong, the old people said, you don't greet them. You don't smile at them. I said, why do I need to greet them? They are not my sheep. I minister to the youths. Why do they need my smile anyway? You know, they said, oh, this young man. That's why they said I was very arrogant. I was like, you know, it's none of my business. I do my part well. That is their, not my ministry. So I heard that this church is full of old people. I actually panicked. I saw how my pastor talked to them nicely, hugged them. I said, I cannot do that. <laughs> There's no way I can do that. And to pray in Hokkien, I was not happy about praying in Mandarin even. And now you want me to pray in Hokkien? But then God brought me back and God gave me, I tell you, yeah, this one thing, let me end with you um, and this with you. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. I think Jehovah Jireh has been so misunderstood by many Christians. Whenever you have some financial difficulty, or you, you have some problem with your livelihood, you know, you need money, you need food, people like to say, Jehovah Jireh is your provider. No, I don't think that is the correct way to interpret. Of course, God will take care of you. Your food, clothing, and that... Just go to the gospel. Jesus said, look at the birds in the air, the flowers in the field. God will take care of, God will take care of you. He's your father. Then just go there and encourage people. It's not Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh appeared when Abraham was offering Isaac on the mountain of the Lord, a sacrifice to God. And he was willing to give everything, his most precious, his deepest love. His, he was willing to give that to God. Only then, Jehovah Jireh appeared to give Abraham the right gift, the right sacrifice, the right thing to use on the mountain of the Lord. Jehovah Jireh appeared when you are willing to give your life, your best, your most precious to serve God to sacrifice to God. So that's why when I went back, I told God, actually before I went back, I was offered, you know, apart from the law, lawyer's job, I was offered to be 
um, the youth pastor, youth pastor of one of the biggest churches in KL. And they promised me they would support my, gospel, my album ministry. They would pay, they would let me go on tour and everything. And there were at least two or three big churches in Singapore who wanted to employ me as a youth pastor, as a gospel singer, everything I want, everything I love. But when I prayed to God, God said, Balik kampong. Go back to Kuching. And I said, but God, I'm not good with all people. I, I don't know how, I know I, I only serve youth. I serve in the music ministry. I have to offer up. I have to sacrifice it all. And then God gave me the gift. And you know, I become quite famous in Singapore. They, they said, I am the pastor to look for if you want ministry to the old people, to the elderly. So it's such a transformation. That is Jehovah Jireh. Suddenly, He would give you the right thing when you are willing to offer up your best, your most precious thing. So, in the end, God made me a Hokkien singer. Before that, my first few albums were all in Mandarin, and people knew me a little, but until God gave me this song, it became an international hit until today, especially in funerals. Yeah. <laughs> because it's, I wrote it for people who are facing death, you know, people who are uncertain, um, they, they are really dying. I asked God for a song. When I sing, the, di the dying people will feel Jesus has come to bring them to, to heaven so they don't have to worry anymore. And sure enough, this song has encouraged so many old people. So I, I tell my church people, now I'm very busy, you know. If, if you're sick or you're dying, normally other people will go. If I go to visit you, and if I sing this song, you know what it means? <laughs> you are going. So in the end, they don't ask me to come anymore. Anyway, this song has encouraged many people and many people, even including suicidal people and the elderly who are very staunch, Taoists and Buddhists. And when they heard this song, their grandchildren, they would write to me. They said, thank you for this song. My grandma, my granddad, my parents, they received the Lord because of this song. And let's give all the glory to God. I'll share this song as an ending to bless you is called Hold My Hand. Hold My Hand throughout the journey of life, especially in the ministry, because the final sentence says, the day I walk up to the door of heaven, I want to hear you say, come in, my child. Come in, my child. Rather than, I don't know you, go away. Right, isn't that true? We can serve so much, we can do so much, you know, so many achievements. But if I reach heaven's door and Jesus say, I never know you, you know, go away, I don't know you. But I want to hear, come in, my child. And for your information, many people sing, request for this song during weddings as well. So you see, the Word of God, it applies in every situation. When you get married, when you die, you can use the same song. Okay. <laughs> Okay. okay, let's sing this song together. Thank you. Hold my hand. It's a Hokkien song. If you know the song, sing along with me. If you don't know the song, that open your mouth. Just open your mouth and pretend you know the song to encourage me, and you can learn together. Can Guai 
有心在安怎行？有时间呐，听不到你的声。牵我的手，请你甲我作伴，好我的脚步又稳又疼。听到你的问津，听到你的声，甲我讲，接来我的囝。Jesus promised He'll be there to receive you. Be faithful to the end. Amen. 牵我的手。我的厝啊，请你莫离开我。这条路，我搁爱行，我需要你来作伴。牵我的手。我的厝啊，请你莫离开我。有时我会惊，有时不知安怎行，有时敢那听不到你的声，牵我的手。请你甲我作伴，好我的脚步又稳又疼。行到你的门前，听到你的声，甲我讲，接来我的囝，牵我的手，请你甲我作伴，好我的。阿婆又稳又疼，行到你的门前，听到你的声，甲我讲，接来我的囝，牵我的手，请你甲我作伴，好我的阿婆又稳又疼。行到你的门前，听到你的声，甲我讲，接来我的囝。行到你的门前，听到你的声，甲我讲，接来我的囝。Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. May God hold our hand, even when we are weak. May God never let go of our hand. Amen. So, if we have any new friends here today, or you have been here for some times, but you are still so uncertain, you are not sure whether God loves you. You are not sure. Whether your name is in heaven, you don't have a relationship with God. Whether you think you are a Christian or not, today is a time to dedicate your life. You might be new, you might be old, but if you are willing, and say, God, I want to be certain, I am your child. I have a place in heaven. I want you to hold my hand throughout the journey of life. If you are that person, you may rise. I'd like to pray for you. Do you have anyone you want to be assured of your faith in Jesus? Hallelujah! Let's encourage them anymore. Whether you are a Christian or a new friend, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord anymore. No, or you want just want to renew your relationship with God? Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Or maybe you have doubts, you know, you have questions, or you feel you might be in church but you're so distant from Him, you are not sure anymore. God, are you still there? I don't understand many things, but today God wants to tell you, I love you, my child. You know, just trust me. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Do we have any more? Even up there, we have quite a few down here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Some more there. Let's encourage them. Any more? Just and I just want to tell you, 
trusts His name means His name is your Father. He is your Father. And He's a good, good, loving and kind Father. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Any more? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Any more? Any more? Anyone up there? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. How? Okay. Now I invite everyone to stand together to encourage them. Let us all raise our hands, especially those who stood up first. Open your mouth to pray after me. Just pray after me now this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your love. I have so many questions or even doubts at times. But today I'm reassured. You love me. You know what you are doing. Father God, I thank you for Jesus, for sending your son to die for me on the cross to shed his blood. I confess I'm a sinner. I need you, Jesus. Forgive my sins. Wash me clean. Write my name down in heaven. You are my Lord, my Savior, my only God, my Heavenly Father. Hold my hand throughout this journey. Even when I'm not faithful, when I'm weak and helpless, Lord, you hold my hand, Lord. You carry me, Lord, because you are my Father. I thank you, Jesus. Your blood is upon me. I belong to you. I'm a child of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's give the glory to God. Amen.